Kenny Anderson, Director of Multicultural Affairs for the City of Huntsville, and welcome to Impact. Each week we bring you information about exciting things that are happening in our community, and today will be no different. Of course, our conversation today will be perhaps a little bit more sober than many others, but I promise it will be just as informative, if not more so. One of the things that people oftentimes fail to recognize is that as passionately as life is lived, death is inevitable. And the reality is that as each of us is on that journey, there's an opportunity to prepare for that journey and do so with dignity and grace. My guests today are here to talk to us about that journey and how to do it with dignity and grace. Dr. Monica Williams Murphy is the author of this wonderful book called It's Okay to Die. And we're gonna talk a little bit about your work and your journey as well. And we wanna say thank you for being on our broadcast today. It's my extreme honor. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, my sister, Reverend Dee Dee Booker Lacey is here with us today. She's with Eagle's Nest Ministries, where my very dear brother and friend, Bishop Daniel Richardson is the uh, head uh, leader of that church, and we're glad to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm really uh, honored to be here. And of course, you serve there as executive pastor, among other things. Yes, sir, I do. Louise Merriweather is with us today. She's an admission coordinator and intake nurse with Hospice Family Care. Yes. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's good to have all of you today. And of course, you know, I started out by may have sounded a little dramatic and everything, but the reality <laughs> is that uh, just wanted to let people know that, you know, there's some sexy topics and there just aren't some sexy topics. And the reality is this is one of those topics that's not very sexy. And the reality is that as unsexy as it might be, it is an essential topic that everyone should have and everyone needs to have because death, just like taxes, is inevitable. Yeah. And we say that, but then we don't want to face the reality of that. I should have also mentioned that Dr. Williams Murphy is also an emergency room physician, board certified. She works here at Huntsville Hospital. Among other things, you are responsible for the advanced care planning and end of life education programs for the community. And so what that means very practically is that I go to churches, mosques, temples, and synagogues and civic events and have conversations about the vital importance of advanced care planning and having open, honest conversations about the end of life. And by doing so, the end of life can become a time of great peace, closure, and even healing. It doesn't have to be negative and devastating to families and communities as oftentimes it is when people don't have an open, upfront, honest conversation. You know, you've written this book and you talk a lot about this journey that I've referenced in the very beginning. And I'm just curious to know, I'm sure from one audience to the next is different, but what is generally your response? Do people uh, find this to be something that is, uh, very, they're very receptive to it? Are they resistant? Are they skeptical? Uh, what kinds of responses do you typically find from your audiences? Well, I've, I've been shocked and surprised, pleasantly so, to tell you that by and large, uh, the highest percentage of people have had relief that a physician is willing to have an open and honest conversation about what I call the map of life to help them identify that themselves or their loved ones are entering the end of life phase. Uh, you know, death and dying is very culturally taboo for us. Physicians aren't comfortable talking about it. Patients and families aren't unless someone starts the conversation. So there's a whole lot of energy being held back and no outlet. And so when I say it's okay and we're gonna talk about this and, and we're gonna make a plan and we're gonna have an open and, and relieving conversation, people go, oh, you know, it is a relief, it is a relief. And I needed to know this information, but I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know where there was availability for it. So um, I've, I've not really had a negative response ever. Well, that's terrific. And you know, you wrote this book and I'm curious as to what the motivation was for writing this book, um, really sort of apart from being a doctor, being involved with this particular work, sure. but obviously you had some internal motivation and drive to make this a reality. What was the driving force behind this book? I did. Um, uh, I would say there are, were professional motivations and personal motivations, and professionally, as an emergency physician, I'm trained in the acute care aspect of medicine, so if you roll into the ER, my entire instinct is to save your life regardless of the cost. And that is very aggressive. That's life support, needles, tubes. And what I found and began to realize about five or six years ago is I felt morally uncomfortable with providing this very acute form of medicine for people who appeared to be at the end of a natural life, who were, you know, it was their time. 
and I began to feel guilty practicing my form of medicine on them. And, and then I began to ask the question, um, isn't there a better way? Uh, instead of being here hooked up to tubes and monitors, shouldn't someone be holding your hand saying, thank you, I love you, and goodbye? And so I began to question myself. It was a moral crisis, mm -hmm. but that was a professional crisis. During the time I began to research this book and think about what I should say, what conversation I wanted to have with the community, my very own grandmother died. And attempting not to be a hypocrite, I really started the advanced care planning conversation with her too late. Mm. The day I drove to her house to have a conversation about a living will was the day she died, Kenny. Wow. Wow. And it was unexpected. I didn't, I didn't know that's where she was. Mm. But uh, fortunately, I arrived in time to ask her her wishes, and we went to the hospital, and we obeyed her end-of-life wishes, and her dying was a sacred and holy experience. Yeah. And it, it awakened in me, and I was embarrassed to say that uh, as a doctor, that's the first time I had witnessed a death that, that felt holy and good and, and okay. Mm. <laughs> and I felt like my grandmother taught me personally firsthand that there's a time at the end of a long life or terminal illness when it's okay to die. Mm. And we need to do our best to make this as peaceful and holy and sacred as possible. I think that's what it was intended to be. And in medicine, we've got to get back to that. We've over-medicalized the dying experience. You and I are more than a body. We're emotional creatures. We're social creatures. We're spiritual creatures. And we have families. And when we're only focused on the organ, and the body, we miss that big picture. And so we've got to bring medicine back to that. So fortunately, we have hospice. Mm. And hospice actually treats you in this more holistic manner at the end of life. Yeah. So I'm a huge hospice advocate. Yeah, I'm a big advocate too. And you know, it's interesting, you use words sacred and holy. And I'm sitting right here with the Reverend Booker Lacey, who's very familiar with those kinds of words, uh, because they shape your reality as a person of faith. And one of the biggest challenges, we recently had a conversation with a small group of people, hospice, family care, and then some local clergy members, and you were part of that conversation around the question of faith mm -hmm. and how sometimes this conversation, as difficult as it is for many people, is especially difficult for people in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. And I thought this would be a good time to maybe briefly talk about some of the concerns that people have when they think about hospice. Mm -hmm and what hospice looks like to people on the other side sometimes, as good of a service as it might be. Yeah, I think that sometimes what happens is, and especially in our community, is in the African American community, it has to do with, um, I believe, sometimes a lack of knowledge of what hospice really is and is not. Um, sometimes we tend to, out of fear, or because the, the misnomer has been placed out there that if you are a part of hospice care in your family, then it is an automatic death sentence. Mm -hmm. And that somehow agreeing to hospice care um, expedite the process. When actually it doesn't do that at all, it actually provides an additional strong support layer for not only the patient, but for the caregiver. So they care for the one who is transitioning, hospice does, but they also care for the one who's caring for the one who's transitioning. And a lot of times I believe that in our communities we don't realize that we need that layer of support um, until we're at the very point where it might not do a whole lot of good. Mm. Um, I think that if we, uh, and it's a trust issue to some degree, because sometimes our experiences have not been such that would lead us to uh, go in that direction. But I think that it's important because, at least for me from a personal perspective, um, knowing that our, my family's involvement with hospice on at least four or five occasions has been the piece that made a difference mm. in the piece we were able to provide to our family member. Mm. You can be a better caregiver when you understand the process that a person is going to, and it doesn't negate their faith in any way. Mm. It doesn't change your prayers for healing. Mm -hmm. It just gives you another layer of support, actually, that will allow you to concentrate in those areas if you are anticipating that one way or another, uh, things are going to get better for the person that you're praying for. Yeah. And if you are the caregiver, uh, if they're comfortable, then you're better. Mm because that, that decreases the stress immediately. Yeah. 
that's a very insightful information that you shared. And Louise, of course, you're what I would call your worker bee, you're a trench warrior. Mm -hmm. You're out there every day facing these challenges with real people mm -hmm. in real circumstances and situations. What has your experience been as a professional in dealing with the question of hospice, working for an agency yeah, that being, provides hospice care? Being at hospice family care, I am an intake nurse. So I get referrals from MDs, and sometimes families are called to uh, get information. And most of the times when I'm getting a referral from a doctor, um, I will call the family and, and let them know that I got a call from your uh, doctor and he wants us to come in and assist you. And often the uh, African-American families, they are like, wait a minute, you know, we have faith. We trust in God, so we'll call you later. And so, of course, I have to uh, respect that. But often, when we go back in, they have suffered a lot of pain, and they needed us there. And as much as, I want to kind of piggyback off of that, as much as the person who is perhaps dying mm -hmm. needs the attention. Yes the people who are caring for that person needs the attention. I mean, every one of us, whether from a personal experience or just from someone that we know, have had someone dealing with a burden far greater than they could bear, mm -hmm. often suffering in silence. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the outcome of their suffering is not known until perhaps days, months, weeks, years later, yes. because they didn't take advantage of that benefit that they have access to. And that's one of the most tragic aspects, I mm -hmm. think, of some of the barriers that exist with hospice right now. One of the things I know you're working to remove. Exactly, and actually, Kenny, what I think is so beautiful about hospice is that in contrast to the rest of medicine, in the rest of medicine, you, the individual, are the unit of care. Mm -hmm. In hospice, the family is mm -hmm. the unit of care. So not only are we working to alleviate the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual suffering of the patient, we're trying to hold and support the family who may have suffering at those levels as well. And so uh, it's, it's a magnificent Medicare benefit. Most private insurers cover hospice. Mm -hmm. And so it's so tragic when people don't embrace this as an opportunity for peace at the end of life at many levels. Yeah. And, and my very own father is under hospice care now. So again, I know this and feel this strongly professionally and personally. Right. I also can appreciate the idea, I think all of you alluded to this, that there's a level, there's a degree of respect that has to be afforded to people who may not be ready to receive the message yes. just yet. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a big part of what you're working on right now, crafting a message and aligning yourself with individuals in the community who can communicate that message. I know, Louise, you're going to be taking on some of those responsibilities yes. through the agency. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Booker Lacey, you're going to be able to do that through Eagle's Nest. And I know there are many other churches in the community mm -hmm. that are signing up to be a part of that as well. And we want people to know that they can reach out to you for information, for services, for education, mm -hmm. and that you're more than willing to provide these things for them. Um, tell people where they can get information, first of all, about hospice family care. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, they can call us at 256-650-1212. And we will come out and give them information just for our information visit. We don't have to have a doctor's orders. We can just come and talk to you. Mm -hmm. And also, we can uh, come to your churches or organizations and just share information. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hospice is not about being a grim reaper. No. It's not about we're no. going to get your family member. No. That's right. uh, That's right. it's, it's all about providing a comfort zone yes. mm -hmm. for people to find peace, yes. to find support, and to be able to allow their person, their loved one, that they feel so connected to with all these emotions involved, mm -hmm. to have a place of dignity mm -hmm. as they move through whatever trans uh, transitory stage they're in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a person can come out of hospice. That's possible. Yes. It yes. does we'll graduate. happen. Yeah, we yes. do have a graduating yeah. program. Yes. Graduate from <laughs> yes. hospice. So, mm -hmm. you know, but that's part of that education piece that yes. you're talking yes. about. Yes, People that um, have these kinds of experiences should not fear them. They should reach out to sources that can provide information. I know Dr. Williams Murphy is a great source mm -hmm. of this information, and you do lectures all over the place. You talk about your book, in fact. I do. And, um, and I've had a chance to hear your lecture. 
um, at least one. I know you had so much more information and you can't get it all in, but you certainly make the most of the opportunity to let people know about what's happening here. So this is a great resource as well. It's okay to die. And uh, where can people get this from? Uh, it's available on Amazon, but also I have a personal website, www.oktodie.com. In addition to having the book available for purchase in soft cover or ebook format, we have free downloadable resources and checklists to prepare yourself or others for a very conscious approach to the end of life. So I just try to do as much as possible to support people in um, making this time of transition a time of peace. We, I want to take the chaos out of it, and I want us to very consciously uh, move toward a place of peace at the end of life. So Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, too, and I know we're out of time, but just the whole notion of providing that place of peace. You mentioned chaos. Unless you've been there before, you have no idea no, yes. about how chaotic the death of a loved one that's is. And right. I'm not even talking about the grieving process yet. That's right. It's just getting everybody, that's why they say we get your, order, your affairs in order. That's important to do well before you face that time because there's so much chaos mm -hmm. in that process and so many emotions at mm -hmm. stake and mm -hmm. so many sensitive areas that have to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And you haven't even had the funeral yet. Yes, yes. Exactly. that's right. And so people need to really have this kind of information to understand how they can get that support. Well, what a great conversation today. Dr. Monica Williams-Murphy, thank you for being here. It's our extreme honor and pleasure. Thank you. And again, thank you for this book, It's Okay to Die. Uh, do you want to get this book? It's certainly a, a great read. It's an easy read and certainly one that would provide some great information. Reverend, Reverend Dee Dee Booker Lacey, my sister, Eagles Thank Nest you. Ministry with my brother, yes. uh, Bishop Daniel Richardson. So good to see you. Thank you so much, Kenny. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Louise Merriweather with Hospice Family Care. Thank you for being here with us today and sharing such great information. Thank you, Kenny. All right. You guys come back and see us now. Don't make sure. this the last time you uh, come and talk to us. We're ready. All right. <laughs> Very good. We have enjoyed our conversation today. At least I know I have. I've gotten a lot more information about hospice. I feel so much more ed educated and enlightened about the services that they provide. And we hope that you have as well. We'll have some information on the screen here so that you can contact them as well. And we hope that you'll take advantage of any initiative in our community that is related to this, that you'll point someone who needs this information in the right path. And just keep your eyes and ears open for additional things that will be coming down the pike as it relates to providing community education about hospice. As always, I'm Kenny Anderson. I hope that you have a great day and we'll see you again.